DirecTV Stream brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before, so you can get all the entertainment you love without the hassle. And there's no annual contract. Get your TV together at directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. Once upon a time in a land far, far away, there lived two men, one more hostly than the other. Their names were Nick Amell and... And Brandon. And Brandon, the sidekick host. Uh, you might say you're the donkey to my Shrek. You could say that. This is the show where one of us brings a top 10 list every week. The other doesn't know what it is. They try to guess items 1 through 10. Although this week, the name 10 is coming into play because a list of 9. Okay. And Brandon and I dropped some very strong hints there at the beginning about what we're going to be talking about. Are these fairy tales? You son of a bitch. You're smarter than you look. You're smarter than everyone says. It is fairy tales. We're talking about the most popular fairy tale stories of all time. Okay. Which... All time might be an <laughs> overstatement. That's how the... Because who the fuck knows, right? It's at least the most popular fairy tale stories of the internet age. Because I got this from a readersdigest.com article, which did the research. There's a website apparently dedicated to fairy tales called Sir La Lune. Sir La Lune. What does that mean? I don't know what that means, but that website records the number of uh, the traffic two different fairy tale stories on their website. Mm -hmm. So that's how they're measuring which ones are the most popular, which ones are visited the most on that website. Okay. I also have some research from HowStuffWorks.com, Fox, and Wikipedia. Before we get too far, Brandon, mm -hmm. what is a fairy tale? <laughs> you ask me to tell the folks at home what a fucking fairy tale is? <laughs> Come on. I don't, are they supposed to have a moral, like a fable? They can, but they don't have to. Just a story with some kind of fantastical shit that happens. A fairy tale from Wikipedia is also known as a wonder tale. I've never heard anyone call it that. A wonder tale, yeah. A magic tale. A fairy story or a mar marchen is an instance of European folklore genre that takes the form of a short story. They usually include mythical entities such as dwarfs, dragons, elves, fairies, giants, gnomes, goblins, griffins, mermaids, talking animals, trolls, unicorns, or witches. Fun shit. <laughs> In most cultures, there is no clear line separating myth from folk or fairy tale. All these together form the literature of preliterate society. So essentially, if I were to summarize it, it's a short story, may or may not have a moral, originating in Europe and involving something fantastical. Right. Of course, today, fairy tale is also known to describe a fairy tale ending, fairy tale romance, or the term fairy tale can also mean any far-fetched story or tall tale. But you've heard of every single one of these fairy tales, for sure. You will not have any issues guessing today. Most of our listeners will be familiar with, will be most familiar with these fairy tales because of Disney movies. Right, those were the first ones I wrote down. We're going to do our best to minimize Disney-related discussion today. Right and focus more on the origins, the history of these fairy tales. And I also have, I'll get into this later, but I also have the unedited, uncensored original tellings of these fairy tales, which every single one of them has fucking violent, <laughs> brutal versions that have been edited in, in like the Disney versions and the modern tellings. So, Well, that's that exciting. Too. Let's get to it. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one I'm going to guess... These are most popular according to like what? Just how many times they've been retold or adapted? You could say that. Uh, so the list is ranked based on that website, Sur La Lane, how many visits that tale gets in a typical year on their website. Okay. But it does correlate pretty strongly to how many versions of that tale there is. So you could say that. Okay. First one I'm going to guess is Three Little Pigs. It's a good guess. I would have guessed it myself, but no, no. it's not in the top, top nine. I'm going with the ones that I recognize from short cartoons. Mm -hmm. The Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood has to be in here, right? right? What number? Uh, oh, God. I have, uh, three or four? Number three. Good job, Brandon. You're off to a good start. Little Red Riding Hood. I think if you were to pull 100 random people on the street in any country, at least English-speaking country, maybe others, and say, like, name the first three fairy tales off the top of your head. Yeah, it's one of the I'll first bet ones. 90 out of 100 would say Little Red Riding Hood. 
All right, so the basic plot is Red sets off alone to visit her grandmother with instructions not to step off the forest path, advice she promptly disregards, attracting the attention of a talking wolf who sets out to eat and impersonate grandma. I like how those are two separate goals. Mm -hmm. I want to eat this girl, but I also would like to impersonate her grandmother. Does he eat the grandma first? Well, that's the next note. What happens next depends on what you read. There's so many versions of this story. Mm -hmm. In the 17th century French version recorded by Charles Perrault, which he intended as a warning to young women to avoid sexual predators. Yeah, that's kind of, he simply the, allows, that's kind of the tone of, the, of even the, car, the, the cartoons, too. The wolf is after more than just what's in her basket. You'll notice a trend today that all these tales today are told as children's tales. They're made into kids' movies, kids' books, kids' toys kids costumes but they all originate from much darker <laughs> more simple times all right stay away from where the naughty boys hang out yeah in other tellings across europe north america china japan ghana little red riding hood uh, she's saved at the last minute by a guy with an axe mm -hmm. or the wolf chokes on her hood while eating her or he eats both grandma and red but is forced to vomit them up unharmed which no, i don't like that one I have at questions all there so he eats them whole and then vomits them up unharmed. I mean, it's one thing to like try to get me to buy this talking wolf, but then to say that he swallows them whole and they survive, he vomits them up unmolested. Hmm. I'm not interested in that. I like, I had not heard. You like a molested. I, like, I hadn't heard the version where he choked on her hood. And I like that quite a bit. Yeah, I'd never heard that. There's one more, which you might like. The Brothers Grimm, you know them? Mm-hmm. Here in a minute, I'll tell you more about them uh, for anyone not as familiar. But in their version of the story, which they called Little Red Cap, uh, Little Red Riding Hood is also devoured by the wolf, but she and her grandmother are then rescued by a hunter who arrives just in the nick of time. Instead of shooting the wolf, he cuts his belly open with a pair of shears and the goal and her grandmother miraculously emerge unscathed. I don't like it where a guy just pops up at the end to save the day. I like it better if you, Little Red Riding... You have a rough time today then. Oh, yeah, I know. There's a lot of men stepping in to save the day in old fairy tales. But not in all of them, because um, the man only shows up in some versions. However, I think he does show up in most modern versions that I hear. So naturally, the bold, independent Red has continued to attract fans. <laughs> Listen to this fucking quote. The 19th century English novelist Charles Dickens heard of him. He said he called Red Riding Hood his first love, saying of his childhood, I felt if I could have married Little Red Riding Hood, I should have known perfect bliss. What? Okay. There was never many details about Little Red Riding Hood. He just liked the color red. He liked baskets. Plus, she's a little girl. Yeah, she's a child. Charles Dickens didn't take to heart that 17th century Frenchman's uh, whole point of avoiding sexual predators. Because Charles Dickens, I don't know, it's, it's a fine line he's walking there with that quote. So Tex Avery, who's that, Brandon? Tex Avery, that's a, um, an animator. Yep. In his short animated cartoon, which a lot of people have seen, Red Hot Riding Hood from 1943, the story is recast in an adult-oriented urban setting with the suave, sharp-dressed wolf howling after the nightclub singer Red. Yeah, it's a, probably a little closer to the original intention. Yeah, that's the really famous, it's a gif now I see all the time of the wolf howling at a table. And Jim Carrey does it in The Mask, too. That's where that yeah, comes from. Yeah, his tongue is lolling out and his eyes are bugging. Mm -hmm. Two more quick notes on this. The origins and history of the story. It can be traced back to several pre-17th century European folk tales. A lot of these we don't know the exact origins, but we know this one goes back several hundred years at least. And this interesting note, there was a survey done by Fox, and they interviewed 2,000 parrots and asked them, when you tell fairy tales to your kids, mm -hmm. do you edit the story to make them more kid-friendly? And if so, which one do you do that most with? And the survey found that Red Riding Hood is the most edited fairy tale when told to children. Because they don't say that, the, that anyone got eaten? I guess. Uh, my kids would not like it if you told a story without somebody getting eaten. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's the best part of the story. I like that part. I don't like how he's cut open and the grandma and Red Riding Hood just step out. No. Uh, Sorry, I, they've been chewed up. Yeah, in my story is if you're eaten, you've been chewed. You have to. The wolf is not a snake the size of a building. 
Yeah, this is a fairy tale, not a science fiction film. Yeah. I mentioned the Brothers Grimm. Uh, so that's a good segue. Let's step away from Red Riding Hood and let me tell you a little bit about the history of fairy tales. The oral tradition of the fairy tale came long before the written page. It's probably no surprise. Tales were told or enacted dramatically rather than written down and handed down from generation to generation. Let me pause there. It is interesting to think that, you know, one of these stories, a uh, few of them I have notes on, they go back thousands of years yeah. at least. And they just survived from people telling them. You know, as dumb as humans are, and, and they deserve a lot of flack for being selfish assholes, they did some cool stuff too. If nothing else, we're good storytellers. Yeah. Fairy tales appear now and again in written literature throughout literate cultures, as in The Golden Ass, which is a book, which includes Cupid and Psyche. That's a Roman, uh, I guess, a Roman stories or set of stories from 1 to 280. The Golden Ass? Yes, The Golden Ass. I thought it was my nickname in high school. <laughs> no, I can confirm that's not true. All right, now, for the first collectors to attempt to preserve not only the plot and characters of a fairy tale, but also the style in which they were told was the Brothers Grimm, collecting specifically German fairy tales. In the 1800s, Jacob Ludwig Karl Grimm and Wilhelm Karl Grimm were German academics and art authors who together collected and published more than 200 tales of folklore during the 19th century. Mm -hmm. The Brothers Grimm, they established a methodology for collecting and recording folk stories that became the basis for folklore studies. Many of the Grimm's folk tales have enjoyed enduring popularity. These tales are available in more than 100 languages and have been adapted by filmmakers like Disney. During the 30s and 40s, the tales were used as propaganda by the Third Reich. What? I, there's no further details on that, but apparently Hitler used the Three Little Pigs to explain why the Jews ruined the world. I don't know. Later in the 20th century, psychologists such as Bruno Bettelheim reaffirmed the value of the work and spied the cruelty and violence and original versions of some of the tales which the Grimm's had eventually sanitized. The Grimm's rewrote the tales in later editions to make them more acceptable, which ensured their sales and the later popularity of their work. But don't worry, we're going to go into the details of those original versions. They used to have, when I was a kid growing up, on Nickelodeon, there was an animated show that just did Brothers Grimm stories. And some of them I had never, ever heard of before or since. But yeah, I, can, I believe there... There's can, more than 200 of yeah, them. They yeah, they had a ton in that show. Most of the fairy tales, almost every person in the world could recite to you today, most of them endured because of the work of the Brothers Grimm. Right. Even if they did, were also used for German Nazi propaganda, which we don't condone. But I do condone you guessing another fairy tale. Okay, yeah, let me guess another one. How about Rumpelstiltskin? <laughs> I've always loved when you say that name. <laughs> I like that. I, you really should have named your kid Rumpelstiltskin. I like that story quite a bit, mostly because of the name. But I think, didn't we talk about it on here before? Like, well, go ahead. Tell us a little bit about Rumpelstiltskin because... Well, go ahead because it's actually not in the top nine, so I don't have any notes for it. Ah, damn, that's nuts. Well, there's a guy who, he lies to a king and he tells him that his daughter can spin straw into gold. And then the king locks her in a room with straw and a spinning wheel and says like... Kings will believe anything back in the day, huh? They were dumb ass. It says, you got to spin this straw into gold by the morning or I'm going to cut your head off. <laughs> <laughs> and she's just sitting there like despondent because her dad is a real piece of shit. Yeah. Uh, got her into this mess. And then this like little goblin guy appears in the room <laughs> and he's like, what's up? My name's Rumpelstiltskin and I can spin straw into gold. No, he does not tell her his name. Oh, that's right. He doesn't say his name. He said he... That's the whole point. Yeah. He appears and he spins the straw into gold and in return for her necklace. And then the yeah. next morning, quote unquote necklace, am I right? Well, the next morning, the king's like, oh, this is awesome. Now he takes her to a larger room filled with more straw. And then that night, the little goblin guy appears again. And this time he spins the straw into gold in return for her ring. On the third day, she's taken to an even bigger room with even more straw and told by the king 
that he will marry her. Is it like, oh, <laughs> two days? As if that's the yeah. two days ago, you were threatening to cut off my head, but now, like, oh, you can mar- you'll marry me. That she'll marry him if he can fill that room with gold, <laughs> or he'll cut off her head again if she can't. <laughs> Men in these stories are real pieces of work. Well, I know which one I'd choose between the head cutting and the marriage. So far, there's only two human men in this story. One is her dad who got her into this, and the other is a king who's threatened to cut off her head. And as a prize, she gets to marry the guy who um, cut off her head. Yeah. So Men have always sucked, and they continue to suck. But she doesn't have anything else to pay uh, the little goblin guy with. So he says... Inst- he's more of a troll really yeah instead he says like i'll spin all the straw into gold but you have to give me your firstborn child and for some reason she agrees to that do we know what he wants with the child i don't know probably to eat okay we don't have to get into it i mean if you want my <laughs> like honest opinion he wanted to do he wanted he wanted to eat it or make love to it yeah the, yeah so the king marries her congratulations which I guess she's happy with, sure. And then they have a child and the little goblin returns to collect it. She tries to give him all of her wealth, you know, all of the king's wealth to keep it. And the the little goblin's like, hell no, I want that baby. And he finally says, you can keep the child if you can guess my name within three days. So she guesses, you know, every name in the book. And then she wanders into the woods she comes across him outside of his little hut in the woods and he's hopping around a fire and singing a song about himself and he sings that his name... <laughs> yeah, we all do that. He sings that his name is Rumpelstiltskin. So the next day, Rumpelstiltskin comes to the girl who's now the queen and she says, Paha, motherfucker, your name's Rumpelstiltskin. He gets pissed off. What a weird deal he made her, by the way. Guess my name. According to the brothers Grimm, Rumpelstiltskin then ran away angrily and never came back. But the ending was revised in an 1857 edition to a more gruesome ending where Rumpelstiltskin, in his rage, drove his right foot so far into the ground that it sank in up to his waist. Then in a passion, he seized the left foot with both hands and tore himself in two. Holy shit. (laughs) That is awesome. I've never heard of that happening in a story. You know, everyone... Everyone who witnessed that was like, okay, I mean, technically we won, but (laughs) no one is going to be able to sleep tonight. (laughs) Tore himself in two because she guessed the name. Then, buddy, stop singing your own name at the top of your lungs in a woods that's not that far from the castle. He was hippie hopping around the fire, praising it, beating his chest about what Uh, what a great little goblin he was. Brandon, I'll give you my entire life's savings if you guess my name in three days. It's just so stupid. I hope you don't sneak up on me while I'm chanting it in the woods. <laughs> okay, I got to guess one that's on the list. Yeah. What about Hansel and Gretel? Uh, I think that's another one. Like I said, with Red Riding Hood, that would be one of the first ones people mentioned. Hansel and Gretel is eight in the top nine most popular fairy tales. The basic plot of Hansel and Gretel, mm-hmm. this is a good one. In a time of famine, Hansel and Gretel are abandoned in a great forest by their wicked stepmother. Unable to resist eating pieces of a real gingerbread cottage. Okay. The hungry children are captured by the cannibal witch who lives there. In the end, they must shove her into her own fiery oven to escape. Fuck yeah. This is one that has a lot of versions. Uh, And what's interesting about this is... When you think about it, this is one of the most frequently visited fairy tale stories on that website. There's so many versions of out, out there, so many adaptations, but Disney has never done it. No. This is where the um, phrase, leaving a trail of breadcrumbs comes from. Yep. Yep. A little fucker left a trail of breadcrumbs. And I think like a witch eating children, which you see in other shit too, like Hocus Pocus, for example, that movie. I think that all started here. Some scholars believe that the Great Famine of 14th century Europe, uh, which I think was right before the Black Death, right? Mm -hmm. They believe that that famine inspired the familiar German version of Hansel and Gretel, which was recorded by the Brothers Grimm some 500 years later. 
In the Brothers Grimm version in 1812, the witch is a seemingly kind old woman who lives in the woods in an edible gingerbread and candy house. Why? Why is the witch living in an edible gingerbread? Don't think about it. Just start eating. I'll let that go. Okay. So she uses that. Oh, I see. This is why. She uses that house to attract children. So she tempts them there so that she can kill, cook, and eat them. She decides that Hansel would be the more succulent child and locks him up in a cage to fatten him up while starving his sister Gretel. Why? Why wouldn't you feed them both and eat them both? I don't know. Eventually, though, the witch decides to eat... Oh, well, here you go. She decides to eat them both anyway, but is outsmarted by Gretel, who at an opportune moment pushes the witch into the oven and burns her to death. <laughs> the witch opens the oven completely wide and is just bent over it with her butt wiggling <laughs> in the air. <laughs> just... <laughs> Couldn't be more tempting to <laughs> shove her in there. I'm sorry. If there's a witch, even if she's not trying to eat you, she's just a witch. And she's, she's wiggling her fanny in the air while she hums right above a fucking oven. She's getting pushed in, and I can't blame anyone who does it. Sorry, that's how I feel. Crime of opportunity. That's my hot take, I guess, of this episode. Hey, it's time for an ad break. This is Brandon, and I've got a call to action for you. An engagement opportunity. I want you to reach into your pocket right now. Hey, not you, creep. Pull out all the coins you got in there. Take those coins, pile them up. Guess what? You've got enough to cover your new Tennis Pod Plus membership. Brings me to my next call to action. Take your phone right now. Go to tennispod.com slash plus. There you'll find information on joining your fellow Tennis Pod listeners as members of Tennis Pod Plus. What is Tennis Pod Plus, you're asking? Why have I said it so many times? Well, Tennis Pod Plus is our new branding for our Patreon. It's where you're going to find dozens of exclusive bonus episodes like our top 10 most popular soft drinks, a deep dive into QAnon, Nick quizzing me on my Star Wars knowledge, and many more. Plus, you're going to get early access to main episodes like the one you're listening to right now. It gets even better because members are skipping this ad right now. They don't even hear it. In fact, members skip all ads on all episodes. There's more benefits available too, like free merch and swag throughout the year, and custom advertising options for small business owners. Signing up is super easy. You just go to tennispod.com slash plus. Within a minute or two, you'll be signed up for as little as $2 per month. That's tennispod.com slash P-L-U-S. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, you can sign up with just one click from our Apple Podcast page. So what are you waiting for? All that shit's coming straight at you. All you got to do is go to tenshpod.com slash plus and sign up. Hans and Gretel, that's a good one. Do you have another guess? Yeah. Uh, is uh, Robin Hood considered a fairy tale? I don't think it is, but... I'm not sure. It's not on here. Okay. What about um, Rapunzel? Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. Yeah, she's got long hair. So if you got Riding Hood at three, Hansel and Gretel at eight, where's Rapunzel? It's got to be up there, two or four. This is embarrassing. Let's do a retake where you're not quite so stupid. Just tell me what number it is. It's number nine. <laughs> okay. Rapunzel's number nine. The girl with the climbable curls is isolated in a tower by a wicked witch. Of course, this being one of the fairy tales for kids, it's only a matter of time before a handsome prince shouts, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your golden hair. And before you know it, they're united in perfect bliss. I like this one because there's a very gruesome version of this I want to get to, but the German fairy tale recorded by the Brothers Grimm was first published in 1812. The Brothers Grimm story is an adaptation of the fairy tale Rapunzel by Frederick Schulz, 1790. Dates back at least to the 1600s, though. Now, in the original Brothers Grimm story, the prince's job is a little more difficult than simply rescuing the princess from her tower. After the prince climbs the, the tower to woo Rapunzel and apparently impregnate her, Hell yeah. <laughs> the, the witch cuts Rapunzel's hair and then abandons her in the desert. Mm -hmm. When the prince returns and climbs the tower, he's confronted by the witch, who taunts him by proclaiming that he'll never see Rapunzel again. Prince, in despair jumps from the tower and lands in bushes whose thorns pierce his eyeballs. Ah. Are you with me? Yeah. He said life isn't worth living. He pushes himself off the top of the tower. He falls eyeball first into a thorny bush. He doesn't die, but he does go blind. He wanders the desert for several years as a blind homeless person until by chance he meets Rapunzel, 
who's struggling along as an unwed mother of twins. Mm. Now, fortunately, wouldn't you know, Rapunzel's tears have the same healing power as they do in, uh, you know, they do like in the Disney movie with her hair. And the prince's sight is restored. The two return to his kingdom to marry. What I thought was interesting about this is this aligns pretty well. Isn't this how uh, you and your wife met and got married? You fell eyes first into some bushes and her tears healed your sight? Yeah. Is that not... I know the broad strokes, that's at least pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, some people think that's funny. My joke there. I liked it better if he murdered the witch at the end. We got some witch murdering later, don't worry. So do I need to guess another one? Yeah, let's go another one. What about Beauty and the Beast? Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> Number two. You had to know this one's high because of the Disney movies. I thought we weren't supposed to talk about those. Well, we're not talking about them, but I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail of the Disney movies, but I am saying that that's a big reason why so many people are looking this up yeah. on this website. So, Beauty and the Beast, a kind of virtuous beauty offers herself as a hostage to free her father from the castle of a fearsome beast. When she falls in love with the beast despite his outward appearance, he's transformed into a handsome prince. Can we break this down for a minute? Her father is kidnapped and held hostage. She offers herself in her father's place. Mm -hmm. She's held captive there and falls in love with him despite the fact that he's a fucking unhuman monster. Yeah, the beast dick. <laughs> There's a lot of problems with this. I don't like it. The same problem we have with Avatar, the movie Avatar, James Cameron's Avatar. Mm -hmm. How he falls in love with an alien. I don't know. Okay. But he looked like a hot blue cat too. Okay, but he wasn't. He's still looking out his own eyes and seeing an alien. Whatever. <sighs> Beauty and the Beast has been retold hundreds of times. So the Beauty and the Beast movies from Disney has rung the company's cash register as a cartoon, a Broadway musical, a soundtrack album, a live action film with listener of the show Emma Watson. But the most commonly retold version is from French novelist Jean-Marie Le Prince de Beaumont. From 1756, although researchers at universities in Durham and Lisbon suggest that the story actually originated more than 4,000 years ago, which I believe it's a pretty simple, basic story. She fell in love with a very hairy boy. Yeah. Oh, you know what? This was the one that was like your wedding story. I'm sorry. This was how you guys met. You're the hairy boy. I'm done. You can go ahead. You don't have anything else on Beauty and the Beast? What do you want me to say? Well... I couldn't find, a, like, an alternate ending that's brutal. Mm. Beauty and the Beast is the lame romantic one of all these. Yeah, they always live happily ever after. We got a lot of death and murder coming, but not in Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, the design of the Beast in the 1946 film adaptation was inspired by the portrait of a real guy. A guy named Petrus Gonsalves, a native of... Tenerife, which is in the Canary Islands, he suffered from hypertrichosis, which causes an abnormal gr growth of hair on his face and other parts. He came under the protection of the French king and married a beautiful Parisian woman named Catherine. Do you want to see a picture of him? I'm trying to find it. Oh, I'll show you a picture of Petrus and Catherine together. He does not look happy. Let me send this to you. Oh, my. <laughs> no, I'm not looking at this guy. Yikes. But hey, beauty's on the inside. Even she, there's a picture with, of him with her, and her hand is on his shoulder. Yeah. And the look on her face it. is like, oh, fuck, what have I done? <laughs> She's like, why couldn't I have been uh, in that castle turning the hay into gold, marrying that king that wanted to behead me? I thought he would have a beast dick. A beast dick. As if that's a good thing, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> what about Cinderella? You're just going to instantly transition there, huh? Yep. From one beast dick to another, let's go to Cinderella, which is number one. And this is a good one to go to next because I got plucking out of eyes among other violent acts yes, coming up for you. Finally. Cinderella number one. Once there was a hard-working girl with a heart of gold and a wicked stepmother. 
She got a makeover from a fairy godmother and scored a dream date at the ball with a prince who tracked her down by her single lost glass slipper. Mm -hmm. Now, apparently, the Cinderella page of that website that this is all based on, Sir La Lune, uh, apparently that section receives twice as many visitors as any other fairy tale every day. I wonder why. So Cinderella is not just number one, it's number one with a big lead. The story has inspired countless modern retellings, including Walt Disney's iconic 1950 cartoon, the blockbuster film Pretty Woman, the novel and movie Ella Enchanted, and too many others to name. Some even saw the familiar fairy tale in the f uh, around the story of Meghan Markle and her engagement to Prince Harry. What do you have to say to that, you curmudgeon? I see that there have been two film adaptations of Cinderella since 2015. The one in 2015 is a live-action reimagining of the 1950 animated film, which Disney is all over right now, just kind of recycling those into um, live-action. But then there was another live-action musical film that came out last year that I didn't even hear about. There's so many versions of Cinderella, and it's a tale... It's the classic tale of, uh, well, well, think about it. This story is, which I'll tell you in a minute, is thousands of years old. And most of the world were poor. Uh, they may still be poor. I don't know the statistics on that. But a lot of people could relate to the mistreated stepdaughter mm -hmm. who was too poor to go to the ball on her own and just cleaned all day and slaved all day. And they see themselves in that, marrying the prince and stepping up in the world. So it's a relatable story to millions, uh, perhaps billions of women over thousands of years. Except it is a little bit bullshit that like, well, maybe it's not. Hey, the only way to raise yourself out of poverty is to marry the only prince in the kingdom. What's wrong with having goals, Brandon? Well, there's going to be a lot of disappointed people, a lot of goals not reached. Your advice is no goals ever. I, my advice is lift yourself up by your bootstraps <laughs> yeah by your bootstraps is that you don't need a prince to go girl yes queen well these days you don't need a prince or a princess you just need a rich desperate old white guy they're a dime a dozen why aren't any of these about like some young goofy horny teenager who gets <laughs> yeah why not yeah hang on i got more on this yeah tell me about the eye plucking uh, before that, let me tell you about this history. So, this story is also well known as the Little Glass Slipper. There are literally thousands of variants across the world, including tales from ancient Egypt and a 9th century Chinese version that might just explain the story's fascination with small feet. Oh, yeah. Because they did that feet binding thing. Have you ever, you've seen the x ray pictures of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's all Gives me the up. willies. In ancient China, they loved their small feet, and it's they were possible. really horny for tiny, fucked up feet. <laughs> yeah, which, yeah, that's a, that's for another podcast. Someday. Eat your heart out, Quentin Tarantino. The version that is now most widely known in the English-speaking world was published in French by Charles Perrault in Histories au Contes du Temps Passé in 1697. Another version was published by the Brothers Grimm in 1812. So. Let's talk about that version. They called it Aschenputtel. Remember, they're German. <laughs> You're German, plus. Do you want to try? Aschenbrodel. Sure. Or Aschenputtel. Yeah, Putel. That's it. The evil stepmother hands a knife to the eldest of her two daughters and orders her to cut her toe off. For when you are queen, you will never have to go on foot. Well, what the fuck? She wants the older daughter to cut the toe off so that it will fit in the glass slipper. Oh, okay. Which belongs to the younger sister. Prince is fooled and rides off with the elder sister because she cut off her toe mm -hmm. until two talking pigeons <laughs> alert him to her blood-soaked shoe, which I guess he hadn't bothered to notice up to this point. What, what kind of trippy... Like, <laughs> I thought we weren't talking about the Disney version, but every version still... This version still has fucking talking rodents. Is a pigeon's not a rodent, asshole? A pigeon is a rodent with wings. Mm -mm. So but, yeah, the... He didn't notice that she was missing a toe and that her glass shoe was full of blood? Yeah, not a, it's glass so he can see right through it. And she did this fresh right before he got there. No time to even wrap it up. God damn. And also, he was there when she tried on the slipper, wasn't he? 
Remember? He's there on his knee putting the slipper on. He didn't notice a missing fucking toe. <laughs> I'll tell you why. It's because his eyes were on the booty this whole time. Didn't have time to look at the feet. The stepsisters had booties. <laughs> Remember in the Disney version, they have those dresses where the booties like 20 feet oh, out from the body. Oh, asses bounce, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the pigeons, <laughs> they tell the prince, hey, asshole, look down at the foot. And he does, so he sees it. Ultimately, he identifies the girl of his dreams, which was the, the stepdaughter. The two evil stepsisters attend the wedding, hoping to curry favor. Mm -hmm. But instead, those talking pigeons blind them by plucking out their eyes. <laughs> those pigeons are fucking badass. <laughs> they should have had that in the Disney version, like, where, you know, she's got the mice. Yeah. Gus and uh, Jack are two of the mice. Yeah, yeah. We just watched that recently. Or, you know, help her around the house. The birds help her make her dress and stuff. Some of the birds that made her dress, you know, towards the end, when they should have done the eye plucking, is in the, again, I'm going back to the Disney version. The animals make her a dress out of, like, scraps so she can go to the ball. Because that's relatable. Yeah, she puts it on the last minute. She sees that she does have a dress, and she goes to join her stepmother and stepsister. She's like, I can go to the ball. Look, I've got a dress. And her stepsisters are both like, no, fuck that. And they start like yanking. They just tear it apart. They just, yeah. that is exactly when those birds should have swooped in and started pecking eyes. Well, I don't understand why the, the birds pecked out eyes at all, first of all. But if they were going to peck out eyes, why not peck out the eyes of the prince who was too, to even like. <laughs> he's, still... the, he's already fucking blind. He needs all the help he can get. What a great like uh, wedding reception though. This is, you're at the palace. You're like, I've never been in a palace before. I've never been to a royal wedding. There's tons of food, tons of booze. This is awesome. This is the only day that everybody doesn't smell like shit. And then on top of everything, I got to see some pigeons fly out of the sky and rake these two chicks' uh, eyeballs out of their heads. But it also tells you about uh, storytelling of the past, where nowadays they're like a, a nice clean ending where everyone... Uh, you know, we don't relish in the suffering of others, even those that were mean to us. But back then, it's like, no, those who did us wrong are going to pay. And they're going to pay in the most violent, brutal way possible. And we're going to include that as the story. I like that kind of story better. Yeah. And I'm with you. Disney should have done it. That's Cinderella. That was number one. Let me quickly recap. We got Cinderella at one, Beauty and the Beast at two, Little Red Riding Hood at three, Hansel and Gretel at eight, and Rapunzel at nine. Okay. What about. Jack and the Beanstalk. I wasn't sure if you'd get that one. Not because it's not well known, but because there's not like a Disney one that comes to mind for most There people. is. There is a great Disney. I mean, it's not a full length movie, but you know the one I where. I guess you're right. Yeah. yeah Mickey. Yeah, I, think you're right. they, I think it's actually called Mickey and the Beanstalk is the cartoon. Yeah. But I've seen it. Yeah. I think everybody's probably seen it a couple of times. That's a good one. It's got all three uh, Mickey, Donald, and Goofy. You know, you said people have seen it. Honest question, do like kids of today see that stuff? I know yours and mine do, but... I think they might have before Disney Plus, like on YouTube or something. I used to have, when I was a kid, we had a VHS that had like multiple Mickey cartoons yeah. on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where we saw it. And yeah, they might have seen it on YouTube, but for sure the first time they like saw some of the older... Uh, Disney cartoons was uh, when Disney Plus came out. That's where that famously dumb giant. <laughs> oh, I love that voice. <laughs> Which way did he go? <laughs> so Jack and the Beanstalk is on here. It's number five. We finally have a fairy tale. Is this the first one? Not about a, a damsel in distress. Hansel and Gretel, I guess, maybe. This one is about Jack. He's a bold trickster and rule breaker. Not unlike his compatriots Aladdin and Peter Pan, he trades the family's only cow for a handful of magic beans. Oh, fucking idiot. I'm sorry, but yeah, fucking idiot. When a giant beanstalk sprouts overnight, Jack seizes the chance to climb to a giant's castle and steal all of his magical possessions. And again, I say, let's say this really happened. Mm -hmm. Say you were dumb enough to trade for the magic beans, you get them, now you got this uh, beanstalk that goes into the sky. That shit would take you, what, like a year to climb up into the sky, maybe? And you got to have a really strong upper body. Yeah, something about this story is unbelievable. <laughs> Plus, if this is a beanstalk and the whole problem is that they're in a famine, why wouldn't you just climb up high enough to get a giant bean 
and throw that down. We're eating bean. Well, because... Because this greedy little fucker wanted to see yeah. what, can, what he could steal from the top. And this, That's right. And he does steal. This hardworking giant who lives in the sky gets his house broken into and get his, gets his shit jacked by this, uh, by this jack. Well, you're fucking spoiling shit here. Come on. As that website, Sir La Lune, points out, the desire for a means of ascending to the sky is a tale as old as the Tower of Babel and Jacob's Ladder. There are versions of the story found among Europeans, Scandinavians, and Native Americans, but the story we know is from England. In fact, Jack is actually English, because if you remember, the giant calls out, Fee, fi, yeah, yeah. fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. Yeah. And how the fuck does he know what an Englishman smells like? He lives in the sky, and presumably, no human's ever been there before. In the Disney version, he came down and he stole the golden harp. There was like a girl who is also part harp, and he stole her. We all know someone like that, right? She's got a harp sticking out of her back. Jack himself is the perfect role model for young imperialists being raised to conquer the globe. He's daring, athletic, bold. He feels entitled to everything he can grab, from the giant's golden harp to the goose that lays the golden eggs. He ruthlessly chops down the beanstalk, killing the giant. Can't you just see him claiming the world and the sky for queen and country? The most commonly told version we know today comes from Joseph Jacob's English Fairy Tales from 1890 though it first appeared in other books going back to at least 1734. And uh, there's some researchers from Durham University that say that the story originated more than five millennia ago. So this one goes back a while. So from the giant's perspective... Which is large. One night or one morning, a fucking beanstalk sprouts out of the clouds <laughs> that you call a floor. Okay. And yeah. this teeny tiny little asshole, this little man... This bold little hero climbs up and scurries into your house, sneaks around, gains the sympathy of your golden harp, yeah, and then robs you and kills you. Before I address that, how'd this giant get up there? Um, if you think about it too long, your brain's going to break. All right. Then I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop us right here. Give me another guess. Let's see. What about uh, oh, Sleeping Beauty? Yeah. Sleeping Beauty's number six. After six, you have two more. Um, four and seven. Mm -hmm. Seven, I don't think you'll get. You've heard of it, but I don't think you're going to guess it. So number six is Sleeping Beauty. Sleeping Beauty, whose main claim to fame is... Sleeping. Her century-long snooze, thanks to the curse of a wicked fairy who isn't... Is Maleficent a fairy? Kind of puts her in a different light, huh? Uh, in the, well, again, my only reference, and I would assume a lot of people's only reference... The like Disney movies. Good visual reference, right, is the Disney animated film. And probably for good reason. Like, even the old Disney films from the 40s and 50s, I put them on for my three-year-old now, and it's not all the time, but it is, I mean, almost like magic. Something about either the animation, the music, or the pace at the which... The whole package. Yeah, some, the whole package is just uh, catnip for little kids. So, um... I think everyone's seen it a bunch. And I always thought Male like Maleficent struck me as a kid as like a witch or sorceress. Witch, yeah. Throughout her childhood, everyone coddles young beauty, sometimes known as Briar Rose. But on her 16th birthday, mm -hmm. fate finds her and off to sleep she goes because of a curse from Maleficent. Dates back to uh, 13th century Iceland. It's found throughout Europe, France, Italy, Germany, and even appears in Arabian Nights. In 1890, Russian composer Chavosky wrote the musical score for a much-loved Sleeping Beauty ballet, and later still, the folks at Disney borrowed some of his music for their 1959 animated film. Talking about Tchaikovsky? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this Disney movie. Disney's Sleeping Beauty was lavishly created in 70 millimeter traditionally inked cells, but originally it, quote, napped at the box office as one newspaper put it. This may be one reason it was Disney's last fairy tale feature for 30 years until The Little Mermaid in the 80s. What? Really? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Because uh, Cinderella was before this, and another one that you haven't guessed yet. Ironically, Disney achieved a much greater success with Maleficent in 2014, the live action with uh, Angelina Jolie. So the Brothers Grimm version is actually relatively clean, but there was a 14th century version in France called 
Purse Forest, in which the prince returns to find the young woman lying in a bedchamber. No- this is the princess, sleep mm-hmm. the the beauty lying in a bedchamber, nude and comatose, and can't resist the urge to have sexual intercourse with her. What? Now, hang on. Hold your thought. She becomes pregnant and has a child, all while remaining asleep. She gives birth while sleeping. Dude, she's going to be fucking pissed when she wakes up. <laughs> you better hope she never wakes up. <laughs> but her infant bites upon his mother's finger, mistaking it for a breast. A teat. Causing, causing the flax chip from the spindle to fall out and the young lady to awaken. Does not say what she does when she wakes up, but yeah, I think she, she has some questions. I would assume raise hell. <laughs> uh, there's another version from 1634 called The Sun, the Moon, and Talia. Mm-hmm. It's a king who impregnates beauty this time. She gives birth to twins. When his queen finds out, she, because he cheated on her, she sends, which the king, isn't that his daughter? Beauty's his daughter? I don't know. Yeah. The queen finds out that he slept with her. She's the princess, but when she was born, they sent her, her name was Princess Aurora, but they sent her away. In Disney version. Right. Yeah. And they sent her away to live with those fairies and be raised like a peasant wretch. <laughs> yeah, it's a wretch. <laughs> but the king finds her and sleeps with her, just as it impregnates her. Gives birth to twins. The queen finds out. She sends her cook on a very non-traditional cooking task, which is to kidnap the children, (laughs) kill and cook them, Mm -hmm. and serve them to her husband, the king, as punishment. (laughs) Fortunately, the cook can't bring himself to do it and serves lamb instead. So I guess he serves lamb telling the queen, oh, this is those twins you wanted me to kill. Whose kids are those? The the princess that was impregnated by the king. Oh, so it's their grandchildren. Yes. And the queen, she's not mad at the king. She's mad at the, the princess. Right, for who, getting... Who presumably doesn't even know that's her... You let him yeah. rape you. So there you go. Sleeping Beauty. Jesus Christ. Not the most feminist movement-friendly story that we've talked about. Well, not even the Disney version, because even that when she's just sort of a pawn in the whole yeah. thing. When I was a kid, and even as an adult, it's still like, holy shit, I can't believe this is a kid's movie. So at the end, Maleficent transforms into a dragon, right? Yes. The prince is coming after her, and he's like got this sword, and he's whacking his way through these like big overgrown thorns that she had come up to block his way to the castle. And the three good fairies are like helping him. At this point, she's still in her like human witch form. And she says something to the effect of like, oh, she says, and now you will face me, O oh prince. And all the powers of hell. Yeah. When she does that, it explodes with fire and she becomes a dragon. My oldest kid was like three or four. He saw that. I was afraid he'd be terrified of it, but he loved that phrase. And he, he loved <laughs> threatening us with all the powers of hell. <laughs> this is a really is this strong. Charlie? Yeah, it's a really strong threat. All the powers of hell. Well, everyone, uh, our Tennis Pod Plus members who listened to that bonus episode last month where Charlie, Brandon's kid, was a special guest mm-hmm. for a game of Would You Rather. Imagine that sweet little voice, that, su- <laughs> that sweet little innocent Charlie voice inviting you to endure the powers of hell. All the powers <laughs> of hell. I love it. Charlie's always been a badass. Do you want an all-star team? Well, you need an all-star hiring partner. You need Indeed. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Indeed is a hiring partner that gets you what you really want, a short list of quality candidates as fast as possible. Indeed is an unbelievably powerful hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Don't struggle on your own to find quality candidates. Indeed got you. Don't even worry about it. They can help you hire the right people right now. Indeed partners with you every step of the hiring process so you can find talent with the skills you need through tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Offer valid through December 31st. Terms and conditions apply. 
Shopify is the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. And I love it because Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources that were once reserved for big businesses. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. I don't talk about it a ton, but I have a fishing company. Five years ago, actually five years ago this month, my best friend Aaron and I started a bass fishing weight company called Woo Tungsten, because woo is the sound you make when you catch a giant bass. So we sell tungsten weights for bass fishing and Shopify has made it so incredibly easy. They have all the tools and the resources that we need. No matter how big or small your business is, they just make it so effortless. And like mine, Shopify powers over 1.7 million businesses from first sale to full scale. And you can reach customers online and across social networks with their ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. And you can gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond, which is something we use a ton. More than just a store, Shopify grows with you. Go to shopify.com slash blue wire, all lowercase for a free 14 day trial and get access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business today with Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash blue wire right now. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Shopify.com slash blue wire. All right. So speaking of ladies that aren't the most empowering for women today, there's another one like that. That's number four. Okay. So we have number four, number seven left. Correct. Let me guess the last two that I wrote on my scratch pad. Okay. One is one that I think is a Brothers Grimm fairy tale. The only adaptation I've ever seen is a live action movie from like the 80s that had Helen Hunt and it was weird and awful. And it sometimes like made me feel like I was in a fever dream because I felt like I was the only person who remembered this movie. The Frog Prince. There's been, there was a Disney movie about this shit. I didn't see it. Okay, well, anyway. Yeah, uh, I know no. that it's good. Like The music is from New Orleans, right? Yeah, it's good. I like it. Uh, I, have, I haven't seen it, but the live adaptation starring all dorky white people came from the 80s was super awkward and lame. But I seem to have watched it like 20 times when I was a kid. That's the thing. Yeah. There's some questions there I have, but we will brush past those. And I will tell you that Frog Prince is not in the top okay. nine. The other one I wrote down was Pinocchio. That's a good guess. Also not in the top nine. Okay. Let me go through some others that I think people might be wondering when's Brandon going to guess those. Mm -hmm. These are all not in the list. Some of you mentioned Frog Prince, Pinocchio, Rumpelstiltskin, Three Little Pigs. But there's also the gingerbread man. Uh-huh. Come on. Gingerbread man has to be a lock, right? Everyone knows that story in the song. The Little Mermaid. Mm-hmm. The Emperor's New Clothes. Oh, I didn't realize that was like a fairy tale. The Ugly Duckling. Mm-hmm. Peter Rabbit. Bluebeard. Bluebeard, the fucking pirate? Yeah. Okay. The Pied Piper. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Princess and the Pea. Oh, yeah, I thought of that one earlier, but uh, I forgot to write it down. No, Obviously not in the did. top Yeah, nine. sure. We'll just have to take your word for it, yeah. That's the one where the princess notices a pea under, what, like 20 mattresses? I think I got a little bit of the princess and the pea syndrome. You think you're a princess? No, I feel like stuff that wouldn't bother, other people wouldn't notice or be bothered by, that's bugging me. Well, this one is the shocker of the day for me. I thought this one would be top three, top five. Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Oh, yeah. Hey, I just found one is, the, is one in the top nine uh, called Donkey Skin. <laughs> no. There's one is that called, real? There's one called Donkey Skin. Maybe that's from that book, The Golden Ass. A king had a beautiful wife in a rich castle, included a marvelous donkey whose droppings were gold. This donkey shit gold. Yes. So the king's wife died, and after making a promise not to marry except to a woman whose beauty and attributes equaled hers, the king grieved, but in some time he was persuaded to seek another wife. It became clear the only woman who had fit the promise was his daughter. Of course. 
So the <sighs> daughter went to the fairy godmother who advised her to make impossible demands as a condition of her consent. She said to ask for a dress as bright as the sun, a dress the colors of the moon, a dress all the colors of the sky, and finally the hide of his marvelous donkey. So the king wanted to marry his daughter so bad he granted all of those wishes. The fairy godmother gave her a marvelous chest who contained everything that she owned and told her that the donkey skin would make an excellent disguise. Disguise? Do I want to keep reading this? Brandon, are you on the dark web? No, listen, the princess ran away and eventually found a royal farm where they let her work in the kitchen, despite her ugliness in the donkey skin. I guess she's wearing the donkey skin. <sighs> and no one's wondering, like, why is this woman wearing the hide of a donkey? And the rest of this, they call the girl donkey skin. I'm really surprised Disney hasn't made this one. Okay, so not donkey skin. Got it. Uh, fucking Snow White. Snow White. That's got to be number four, right? That's number four. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Famous today because of Disney is a very old tale. The basic plot is Snow White is more of a patsy than many of these fairy tale heroines, which is saying quite a bit. The most active thing she does is mother a household full of dwarfs. That's no small thing, though. She never retaliates against the evil queen who tries to kill her for her youth and beauty. She waits for her prince frozen in her glass coffin, as feminist critics have put it, quote, an object to be displayed and desired. Patriarchy's ideal woman, the perfect candidate for queen. Same kind of deal as Sleeping Beauty. She's just there for some dickhead prince to wander up She's and be... just a plot device. Like, the prince doesn't factor into the plot at all until he just no, until fucking very wanders end. up to the end. And then he kisses the fucking corpse. You know, last week we talked... Was it last week, week before we talked about 911 calls and finding a body? Yeah. Like, you wouldn't want to go over there. I'm like, I'm not fucking with that body. There's a man down. That's all you need to know. Man down over here. You come get him. Come scrape this shit up. I found it. I reported <laughs> it. But in two of these stories, a prince comes across a comatose woman, in one case nude, and decides to lay down on top of her and make a baby. And in Snow White's case, he's like... Yeah, why was she naked? Yeah, I don't... I mean, these were clearly all written by men. Well, women probably weren't allowed to tell stories mm -mm. when these were created. And on that note, this was created by the very historically progressive Germans, the Snow White story. The Brothers Grimm published it in 1812. The story is especially notable because it launched the modern trend of sanitized fairy tales. In other words, Snow White, which came out in the 30s, the movie from Disney mm -hmm. came out in the 30s. That's when fairy tales started to be cleaned up with, all, you know, all these cleaner endings than some of the ones I've been reading. Without all the raven And eye plucking. Back in 1938, Walt Disney, the man, decided to make the Brothers Grimm story Little Snow White into his first full-length movie. Naysayers, including his own wife Lillian, tried to talk him out of it, warning that adults wouldn't sit through a musical featuring a bunch of bearded dwarfs, but he trusted his gut and borrowed one and a half million dollars to make it. The movie took almost four years in an astronomical, at the time, $1.7 million to create and was released for its premiere during the Christmas season of 1937. But that paid off for Disney, obviously. It launched a hugely successful franchise. It also set the tone for kids' movies forever since. We got sidekicks for comic relief, animal helpers, warbling songs. Uh, it was also the first film soundtrack to ever be released separately as an album. Animal helpers. Last note is that while Disney kept the macabre heart in a box angle, he did omit some even grislier details. In the Grimm version, for example, Snow White's evil stepmother is invited to Snow White's wedding where the guests heat a pair of iron shoes on burning coals. Stepmother is then forced to step into the red-hot footwear and dance in agony until she falls down dead. This is the ending of the original story? Is that, That's her come up. This is the ending of the Grimm's version. Yeah, that's her come up, and she has to dance in burning hot iron shoes until she dies. You know, like, in the whole crazy, fucked up history of the world, somebody's done that to somebody before. They would, like, put these red hot shoes on and start dancing. And by the way, how hard is it going to be to do the stanky leg or to do Gognum style when your feet are freaking screaming on fire? <laughs> Gognum style. 
Something else on fire is number seven on this list. It's your last one to guess. Mm -hmm. You said this is the one you don't think I would guess. I don't think you'll guess it, but I know for a fact you know this story. Okay. We've mentioned it on the show before. Hmm. And I think it's bigger in other countries, which is why it's so high. Okay. I'll tell you, the main character is not a damsel in distress. Uh-huh. And it's also not a male hero. Is it an animal? It is an animal. Hmm. And it's not donkey skin. <laughs> no. There's a fashion statement as part of this story and title. Oh. The pig's new hat. Is that a thing? No. It's part of the Shrek universe. Well, I mean, that's pretty much everything, isn't Puss it? Puss in Boots. Oh, Puss in Boots. Puss in Boots is number seven. I mean, I've definitely heard of Puss in Boots. There's a Netflix series based on the Shrek character that my oldest kid liked a lot when he was little. That was actually pretty good for something that kids watch, but I do not know anything about the original story of Puss in Boots. This is one of the older ones on here. Puss is a bold, swaggering trickster who masquerades as the servant of a great nobleman. Eventually, his clever tactics bring his young master fame, fortune, and a fancy wife. <laughs> the oldest written telling is by Italian author Giovanni Francesco Straporola, who included it in his, uh, I don't know, some book in 1550. Puss seems to have acquired his swashbuckling boots. Hell yeah. So, this is evidence to me that you somehow infiltrated the fabric of pop culture. Fucking literature for the last hundreds of years? Yeah, probably. You introduced this word into the lexicon a few episodes ago, and now it's being used in Reader's Digest articles. Anyway, he acquired those boots about 100 years after that Italian version in a French story. He's been rocking those boots ever since. What's with those boots? Well, in an age when the poor mostly went barefoot... Shoes were an important status symbol. Oh. So people liked this kitty because he was uh, sticking it to the man. Scholars say the story has been found in all parts of Europe, Europe, across Siberia, onward to India, Indonesia, and the Philippines. It also traveled with colonists and travelers from Europe to Africa and the American Indians. More recently, of course, Puss has found new fans and stolen the show in DreamWorks Shrek movies, voiced by a smoldering Antonio Banderas, listener of the show whose signature introduction is Puss and Boots. Of all the stories we've talked about tonight, Cat Wearing Boots is probably the most fun. And it's also the most like, uh, you know, we're not trying to tell some moral here. We're just having fun with a cat in boots. We're not telling you about Little Red Riding Hood, how she should avoid sexual predators, and we're not telling you about, I don't know, it's just a nice, clean story. Yeah, Charles Perrault, the Frenchman, his collection of tales are the Mother Goose Tales. That was my next and last note of the day. The uh -huh. earliest English editions depicts an old woman telling tales to a group of children beneath the placard inscribed Mother Goose's Tales. Yeah. So uh, Puss in Boots is, uh, and the book that it was included in, is credited with launching the Mother Goose legend in the English-speaking world. The Mother Goose thing was wrapped up in Nickelodeon uh, in the 80s, too. Mother Goose, I know she was old and rickety and, you know, she talked like an old lady, but I don't know, some of the depictions I see of her, hell of an ass. I like this picture of the uh, puss in boots. He looks like a dapper, early 1800s Frenchman, except for the fact that he's a cat. Puss in boots in the Shrek movies really does steal the show. Yeah. Like I said, is uh, the Netflix series. I think there's one or two seasons was uh, surprisingly good for kids crap. Well, speaking of kids crap, you have successfully it. guessed it. the top nine fairy tales in modern history. Well, not modern history, all of history, but the ones that are most popular today. Let's go through those nine. Number nine, Rapunzel. Number eight, Hansel and Gretel. Number seven, Puss in Boots. Number six, Sleeping Beauty. Number five, Jack and the Beanstalk. Number four, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Number three, Little Red Riding Hood. Which, well, hang on. Number two, Beauty and the Beast. Number one, Cinderella. I was uh, skimming back through my notes while I was reading those, and I came across this one from Red Riding Hood again that I mentioned earlier, where it's the most edited by parents fairy tale. 
And that's only because these parents haven't heard the real versions of these other stories. Yeah, with the eye pecking and the... Most parents yeah. have probably heard the cleaner versions. Most parents are probably telling them based off the cartoons that they saw. Yeah. Those will be the enduring tales. But prior to the Disney movies, the enduring tales were the Brother Grimm versions. And now it's the Disney versions that will live forever. The Brothers least. Grimm versions are a little more uh, metal, though. Agreed. I lied. I have two more fairy tales to share with you. Are they podcast reviews? They come in the form from the magical enchanted land of Podchaser and Apple Podcast. I have one here from the Man Chatter podcast on Podchaser. Mm -hmm. Just started listening to this pod and these guys have great chemistry. Nick comes in hot to balance out the mellow stylings of Brandon. The show is hilarious and educational. I'm all in. I'm only mellow because I'm drunk. And I'm the hot one. Let it be known. One more here on Apple Podcasts. This one comes from Task Force. If you ever want to argue with yourself or at least a couple of dudes that can't hear you argue about the top 10-ish things of all time, you have come to the right place. From video games to baseball, porn stars to presidents, these dudes will find you the top 10. Then they will keep you guessing for an hour as they walk through a list of factual top 10 lists using research to back it up. It's incredibly frustrating, yet undeniably entertaining. <laughs> Plus, I have several episodes to catch up on. Great show all around. Thank you. Porn stars to presidents. I think that, that might be the new tagline. I mean, that also describes just one president. <laughs> oh, man. Well, he wasn't a porn star himself, thank God. No. Oh, man. A sex tape's going to come out someday, isn't it? Of him? You know he's made them, yeah. No, I don't think that he has made any, but I... Epstein, whoever's got Epstein's tape. Yeah, I'm sure tapes. someone has recorded him. Although, <laughs> yeah. Well, isn't that the big rumor is that the Russians have a pee-pee tape of him like having a bunch of hookers pee on a bed that the Obamas slept in? Trump? Yeah. Oh, God, I hope. If that's true, I hope it comes. I just hope, just release it, Putin. Come on. Yeah. Release it like you're Putin, Putin. Those were podcast reviews. If you want me to read yours on a future episode, there's a couple of places you can go. You can go to Apple Podcasts. You can also go to Podchaser, or you can go to Good Pods. Just search for Tennis Podcast, leave a review, and I'll read it. I'll listen to it. Brandon, this has been a fairy tale of an episode. Thank you for joining me on this adventure today. <laughs> it's going to end with me getting my eyes pecked out by <laughs> pigeons. Yeah. Don't answer the door, because those might be talking birds that I sent to pluck your eyes out. If you hear a flapping at the door, I won't answer. Yeah. Well, listeners, I want to thank you for joining us here on episode 154. I want to in encourage you to not impregnate naked sleeping women in the woods. I also want to encourage you to follow us on social mediums such as Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Reddit. We're on all those at Tennis Pod. You can also follow me, the star host, at the Nick E M E L on Instagram and Twitter. And Brandon, I think you might be on Twitter too, right? I'm on Twitter. You can follow me at Sidekick Host. All right. That'll do it. That's that. See you next week for episode 155. Thanks. Bye. Bet Sportsbook again? Yeah, man. Want to get in on these bets with me? Okay, fine. Just sign up. Yes! See? WinBet. Told you. Sign up at winbet.com today using promo code BLUEWIRE to get up to $1,000 toward a risk-free sports bet. That's W-Y-N-N -N bet and promo code BLUEWIRE. Offer subject to change, terms, and conditions at winbet.com. Must be 21 or older and present in the state where playthrough WinBet is available. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700.